I came across the vinyasa practice on the 8th of August 2015. Now some people might be thinking, why is it? I remember the actual date. The 8th of August, in Sashul Pima Orgasm Day. So it originally started in Northeastern Brazil by a Brazilian councilman. And the reason why he wanted to dedicate to the day specifically to Pima Orgasm was because he wasn't able to satisfy his wife. In order to repay the sexual debt, as a councilman, he um, legislated an unofficial day in recognition to the female orgasm. So it's not just a day for people to enjoy themselves between the sheets. It's a day to encourage and to raise awareness about female sexuality. If I was to ask people, what do you know about the African contribution towards sexuality? The first thing that comes to many people's minds is FGM. Africans have contributed and black people towards sexuality in a positive light. And I wanted to raise awareness and kind of bring that to light, especially the contributions of black women. So with the Kinyaza practice, it originated from Rwanda, involves um, the man using his penis to stimulate the woman's clitoral glands um, in a rhythmic fashion in order to help her induce female ejaculation and or squirting. It's a practice that was originated by a woman. It is generally passed down by women and it's generally taught by women. So you must be asking why is the man talking about it? <laughs> I'm talking about it because I just think it's important and I think it's important that other women of all ethnicities and backgrounds are aware of the contributions that black women and black African women have made towards um, this topic. When we talk about things like female sexuality, sexual liberation, body positivity even, it is not a Western export. It's almost the polar opposite where the Western export has been a suppression of sexuality which is strongly informed by, for example, the Victorian era when everything was pushed down quite brutally. It's something that is ingrained in culture and identity. I think that's why we thought the film was really important in challenging some of these understandings and stereotypes. When people were referring to um, when you've heard like, people speak about juice for orgasms, ace for orgasms, these are all parts of the clitoris, but they're the inner parts of the clitoris. So it's important that people understand um, like the female anatomy. Now, the, I've got an issue with that. You know the G sport was named after a man? <laughs> yeah, it's named after a man, Dr. Ernest Graffenberg. So you've got, and again, that's, it's problematic that a woman's like lady parts, or part of a woman's anatomy is named after a man. Now, That's okay, we'll just start calling penises <laughs> Susan. <laughs> exactly, right, exactly. There was supposed to be no pleasure for the woman. You just had to do your duty to your husband to produce children. There was, the man had no idea of how to sexually please his wife. As long as he got what he wanted, which is the orgasm, and then hopefully children, he felt he had done his job. I, th I think it's the cultural thing that um, Africa and um, Middle East, etc., were more sexually liberated than the West. Buganda, where I was born and grew up, but I was uh, of Kenyan parents, um, we knew that women all, always outnumbered men, and there was polygamy. So satisfying the husband is a way of having an upper hand over him, or over the other women, that at the point of orgasm, man is, a man is at his weakest, but it's a point a man wants to reach. So we in Buganda, we, you heard it from a very young age, that there are ways of keeping your man. And so from a very young age, they, we knew that um, it's a way either to keep your man or to get a man you want. Mm. So, so I grew up and I've always maintained that it's not for men, but I hear outside and I sympathize with views of people, again from East Africa, where um, you know they didn't really talk with their grandmas about this, so they didn't really know. So it's part of the story is that yes, it's for the men, um, you know, to please men. It's uh, uh, one of the chauvinistic, patriarchal, you know, all the negative things, but. A side, a side of me, which I grew up with and which I believe in, I know that it is a, a strong point women have. So it's power in the women's hand to do things better. My father was really interested in history and one of the stories he told me about, which again was an oral tradition passed down, was a story about Shona princesses, the women rule the kingdom. And unfortunately they lost that power because the queen fell in love with a male slave. And because of that, he was able to overthrow the queen and the men supposedly took over. So it's interesting that that is how it happened through a physical relationship. And it's like we're back to that now, all these centuries later, 
where our power as women is being suppressed. And when we talk about pleasure, it's forbidden. And yet, from the dawn of time, it had to be neutral because the two go together, don't they? And for me, it was um, not only insightful, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was also very educational. I'm really happy I saw that. Kunyaz is not just about pleasure, it really is about having a happy relationship and love. And that was really, I thought, very beautiful. In the UK, um, squirting or female ejaculation is banned in pornography because it seemed it's considered to be urine. All of a sudden, a lot of Westerners accepted it like this is actually a fact. And I think one of the frustrations that a number of Randys and other um, people in East and Central Africa have is that, okay, because you've now said um, you consider it to be urine or you don't consider it to exist, you have issues, not us. So when I listen to sex educators in the UK or in America speaking about female ejaculation, a lot of the things which they speak about, which is not really spoken about in the documentary, is the importance of women obviously being relaxed and at ease and letting go because they've been told that this is something that is not natural. For me, seeing this coming out of Rwanda is very good, but also, you see, they framed it within um, rural Rwanda, which is good because in a sense when you look at indigenous African language, you kind of like to see it within the backdrop. So seeing the elderly auntie going into the bush to get the leaves, mm. um, and, and not a Viagra in a, in a, in a, in a uh, pharmacy shop, but something produced, it shows also that um, sex education was framed within the ecology in which the people existed. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very good. Even when she said, don't tell your father. Of course we never told the men. Who tells the men? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was a lady's... So there was certain knowledge which was uh, owned by women. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very good. So the backdrop was excellent. Well, I would like to see this kind of knowledge become part of some sort of curriculum and receive um, the historical attention it deserves. So become part of a greater understanding, something that is important. And I think there is a lot of um, lessons that even the West, even Asia, God forbid, the entire world can take away from the continent. There is practices around community, around mental health and around sexuality and erotology that I would like to see them spread far and wide. <laughs> a book bought for me by my mother which explained the act of sex, the mechanics of making a baby. I saw a pornographic magazine belonging to a neighbour, very visual, mostly white women, very male dominated. Something preparing girls to be future wives and learning about satisfying their husbands in the future. A boy showing me his penis. Aged about eight, finding the Joy of Sex book in my parents' bedroom with my older brother. We couldn't believe the drawings. We invited our friends over and our neighbors to look at it. <laughs> After a few weeks, the book disappeared. <laughs>